Massachusetts near San Luis. So that's, that's Fort Massachusetts there. It says New Mexico because it was in the New Mexico territory in 1857. And, and Fort Massachusetts was fairly newly founded, uh, ostensibly to, to guard against Indians, but some of the people in the San Luis Valley who were of, of Mexican ancestry thought it was also there to watch them. Um, so the Marcy Loring Expedition, the next spring, they were supposed to head to Utah via Fort Bridger. So they were gonna go back north and then Marcy, Captain Marcy's larger force was told to wait on Fountain Creek outside of Colorado Springs um, and that more supplies and men were on their way. Loring's group, which was a smaller kind of hit team, started out from near Taos, New Mexico at the end of April 1858. And with them was Michael Fagan, a citizen teamster hired in New Mexico to guide the soldiers and supplies up to Wyoming. Not that kind of teamster. This kind of teamster. <laughs> um, the two groups were within seven miles of each other. So they're, they're getting to Fountain Creek, just east of Colorado Springs. And um, The two groups were within seven miles of each other on April 29th, 1858. Marcy was on Black Squirrel Creek and Loring's group was seven miles north at Point of Rocks. Captain Marcy, I have some quotes from Captain Marcy. He said he would remember that spring day of the 29th of April, 1858. His supply train enjoyed a warm, pleasant afternoon, graced with the mild April weather that signaled springtime in the Rockies. So this will sound a lot like a normal April in Colorado. The day was bright, cheerful, and pleasant. The atmosphere soft and balmy and delightful, and fresh grass was about six inches high. The trees were put forth of their new leaves, and all nature conspired to giving evidence that the somber garb of winter had been cast aside for more verdant and smiling attire of spring. Uh, then he talks about the animals, and the guys are playing games, and everybody's happy. Okay. Then, this pleasant state of things lasted until near sunset. When the wind suddenly changed to the north, it turned cold and soon commenced snowing violently and continued to increase until it became a frightful winter tempest, filling the atmosphere with a dense cloud of driving snow, against which it was utterly impossible to ride or walk. Late that same afternoon, 2nd Lieutenant Dubois had ridden ahead to Colonel Loring's camp at Point of Rocks to visit some of his friends from the other unit. And then at sunset, he attempted to turn, to return to Campton Marcy's camp on Black Squirrel Creek, but then he couldn't find his way in the wind driven snow. So he came back to Point of Rocks where he would then write about the storm in detail. Returning, I sat down by McNally's fire, but this soon became worse than nothing. We went to bed early, morning came and still the storm raged with a redoubled fury. Our beds were covered with snow to a depth of two feet. It was almost impossible to stand before the fury of the wind. A fire could not be lighted and cold raw bacon was all we could find to eat. Half the tents were down and the men under them covered in drifts of snow. Not a soldier was visible. All our stock had stampeded. Nothing was left in camp but McRae's horses. All day it snowed. All night I slept in McRae's tent. Although we couldn't sleep, it was so cold. We drank four quarts of liquor during the day when we were in the snow without feeling any effect. During the night, we heard cries and opening our tent, two Mexicans stumbled in almost dead. Their limbs and faces were completely frozen. One had carried the other half a mile and being lost in the drifting snow, our light had saved their lives. We rubbed their limbs and gave them blankets and in two hours, they were almost comfortable. In the morning, a dead man was found within 100 yards of our tent, frozen to death. It still snowed on, but by night there seemed to be some prospect of change. The men were turned out from their nests under the snow and some attempts were made to cook. This morning it has ceased snowing. We buried the man who had frozen to death. And the man who had frozen to death was named Michael Fagan. After the storm passed, a burial detail scraped away the snow along West Kiowa Creek and dug a shallow grave to hold the remains of the frozen teamster. To keep the wolves away, they placed several rocks over the grave with a larger rock at either end. They also erected a wooden cross 
with the inscription Michael Fagan, May 2nd, 1858. Um, and then in Colonel Loring's diary, it says a citizen teamster in the quartermaster's employ was frozen to death. So that is the site of Fagan's grave. So those are the rocks that they put on the grave. Um, so people started to see the ghost of Michael Fagan as far south as Oklahoma and as far north as Wyoming. So Michael Fagan's ghost um, became a legend of the West. And uh, people, people saw him riding, I mean, one lady said that she saw him riding through her laundry. Um, and this, this point of rocks had be, became by 18, between 1859 and 1865, it became a, a camping spot as you're coming out here for the, for the gold rush. Um, and there, there were those who claimed that the teamster had been buried alive and his ghost, they said, could still be seen riding in the wind on the backs of buffalo and wild horses. Others spoke in hushed tones of a strange figure dressed in full army uniform and with a musket in hand who would materialize in the dark to stand sentinel over the lonely grave. And even those who believe, didn't believe in ghosts continued to spread the rumor of a cache of whiskey hidden somewhere in the valley near the grave. So then you have this guy, Dick Wooten. He, uh, he, he, his nickname was Uncle Dick Wooten um, because he was a sort of notorious Colorado storyteller. And he was um, a Confederate sympathizer in 1861. Uh, there is a story that a Confederate flag flew over a bar in Denver for half an hour before somebody pulled it down. We were very securely a Union uh, territory. So a lot of the Confederates started to get out of town in, in Denver, and there was, there was a belief that they were in danger of being arrested. So Dick Wooten uh, actually owned the, if you've ever been to Santa Fe and you've gone over the pass near Trinidad, he owned that um, toll road that was there. You used to be a toll to go to Santa Fe over what is now I-25 and Dick owned that. And so he was sneaking out of Denver <laughs> to go down to Pueblo in 1861. And he ended up camping at Point of Rocks. Um, and the, the story is that he was awakened by the sound of horses hooves. He hurried to a ravine where he had hidden his own horse and made ready to gallop off should the visitors prove to be a posse from Denver City. Suddenly out of the darkness came a voice, look sharp now for ghosts, this is Fagan's camp. And they say the dead soldier's ghost stands guard over his grave every night. As in cue, the smoldering campfire burst into flames. The startled visitors would have bolted for safety at once had not calmer, a calmer voice suggested they make an investigation. Not a word above a whisper was spoken as they approached the fire. Finally, someone blurted out, it's Dick Wooten's campfire and I'm a natural born liar if he ain't been asleep on Fagan's grave. Then, <laughs> He himself emerged from the shadows, found the visitors to be friends, all of whom had left Denver also because they were Confederates. Um, and then he said in his autobiography, we didn't look for another camping place, but raked together the remains of the fire and piled on more fuel. Nobody cared much about sleeping, but we sat around the fire and talked over war matters. Um, then we went to Pueblo and never heard anything more about proposed arrests. When it got noised around that I had not only stayed all night at Fagan's camp, but actually kindled the fire on the grave and slept alongside of it until I was awakened by the party looking for me, I spoiled a very pretty ghost story and Fagan's camp was no longer avoided by the mountain men or other travelers who had occasion to go that way. So, you know, is Dick Wooten the original Colorado Ghostbuster that uh, he would claim that he was? So my next story is about the Old Stone Church. That is the longest of the stories, I promised. Um, the Old Stone Church, uh, which isn't called that anymore, it's, it's called something else now. It's another restaurant in Castle Rock. Uh, but it was originally St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church. Um, it's built of rhyolite, it was dedicated uh, the December 16th, 1888. And it was built by the community members out of local rhyolite, which is stone that was quarried in Castle Rock. It cost $1,000. Um, founding members of the church included local lawyer William Dillon and a number of German Catholic families who lived just southeast of Castle Rock. 
Um, and then that's one of the German families, that's the Debkis. <laughs> um, this is also the Debkis. Uh, priests came on circuits to a number of communities to minister to the church, which didn't have regular services until 1930, when Father Stadel was assigned permanently to a circuit that included that church. He built the vestibule and the back room areas of the church. Uh, in the 1920s, the Klan burned a cross on the front lawn of the church because it was Catholic. The church moved out in the early 1960s, and since then it has housed a series of restaurants. So the ghost stories there, uh, this was one of the last places I always check up on. Um, so the, my, my last day at Douglas County, we had my going away luncheon here, and I asked, because it was a new owner by that point, and I asked if their staff was still experiencing uh, ghost stories. And they said yes, and they had only been in there for maybe three months by that point. Um, but the manager had said he had an app on his phone that was like a, uh, like a security app, motion detector app, and he had to turn it off because it kept going off and alerting his phone like constantly in the night. Um, they've had stories of salt and pepper shakers moving, um, noises in the kitchen, pots and pans clattering to the floor when there's nobody in there, like as they're trying to close up. Um, and the most notorious stories that I have heard are, if you go in there, there's a balcony um, right behind this rose window that's here. There's, a, there's like a little, what was the choir loft probably, or the organ loft. And somebody, you used to be able to sit up there to have dinner and uh, a, a little girl actually said that she saw another little girl up there with an axe in her head. Now, I don't know why there would be a little girl with an axe in her head at the Old Stone Church. Um, there have also been stories of a, a lady sort of in Victorian dress lighting candles in the front vestibule. Um, and that was a staff member as they were trying to close up for the evening because they went out to say, we're closed and there wasn't anyone there. Okay, so the Cantrell School, this is another Castle Rock story. Uh, this building is still there as well. It was built in 1898 to replace the school that, had on, that was previously on the site that burned down. It was the original Castle Rock High School. Um, so this is an ad for the original Castle Rock High School, which was the only high school in Douglas County. Um, and it has a gym, an auditorium, classrooms, and a bell tower, and a grand staircase that's uh, right behind that arch there in the front. Uh, the school district now uses it for offices. So this is a picture of the building that it replaced, which burned down in, in 1898. And the, the fact that this earlier building burned down, it was a, it was a defective flu. But there was a story about that building uh, involving a skeleton. So if you are down in Castle Rock and you go north of, if you're on the frontage road of I-25 and you go just north of the high school, there is a gulch just north of Douglas County High School called Hangman's Gulch. And the story was that in the pioneer era, so before, actually before the town of Castle Rock was founded in 1874, uh, there were two cattle wrestlers down near Larkspur and one of they were they were picked up by a posse who were going to march them up on their horses up to Denver to put them on trial. One of them got lippy right in Larkspur, so they just hung him there. And the other one they got to Castle Rock before he started getting getting mouthy. So they hung him in uh, you know they hung him near there, and then they buried him in that gulch that's now called Hangman's Gulch. And the gulch isn't much, you know, it's, it's basically a, it's, it's not even as big as like um, the, the canal there as the Highland Canal it, near Highlands Ranch. Um, so, you know, they just sort of buried him in the side of the creek bed. And then when a big rainstorm came along, the bones came up out of the, out of the creek bed. And so the enterprising citizens of Castle Rock supposedly assembled the skeleton and used it for anatomy lessons at the high school, the one that burned down. There was also a story that somebody ran into that building as it was on fire to save the skeleton and pulled it out. Um, 
we have not found the skeleton to my knowledge. I used to make a joke about if you go to, you know, if you go talk to the Douglas County School District Administration, ask them if they have any skeletons in their closet. Um, there could be a literal skeleton somewhere in that building. So ghost stories in this building include a blue lady supposedly coming down the stairs. Now this is, this is a, a pretty famous ghost sighting photo. It's not from Castle Rock, but it's just demonstrating a, a woman on stairs, uh, but she is supposedly in blue. Um, they have also in this upper right hand corner here, that used to be the school media lab where they kept all the books that the school district uh, would provide to teachers. And I talked to one of the staff folks that worked there and she said, well, we were looking for a particular citation out of a book. They, they couldn't figure out which book it was and it fell off the shelf and fell open to the page that they were looking for. Uh, so it was kind of helpful. Um, they've also always heard bumps and noises. I mean, it's an old building, so you're gonna, you're gonna hear that. Um, so that is the Cantrell School. I have had people share photos that they've taken because now it's quite grown up, the, the trees. I mean, this, this picture was taken when it was brand new, um, but there's a lot of trees and it has a good October creepy vibe about it. It's in a residential neighborhood. And so people will go by and take pictures of the building. Take, and I've had several people share pictures where they think they've seen reflections in the windows or someone looking out. Um, it's on the block by itself. There's now an addition on the back of it. Okay, so the Spring Valley Cemetery. This is in southeastern Douglas County. Uh, really pretty drive uh, in the summer. Not so great in the winter. It's on a, it's on a gravel road. Um, so the oldest grave here is from 1870. Uh, it's a guy named Horace Reynolds and a guy named Daniel Holden deeded the eastern half of the cemetery to the Spring Valley community for a dollar in 1877. This kind of serves that southeast portion of the county, which is still a lot of big ranches and farms. So the, there's a small chapel that was added in 1966 and it used to be maintained by a lady named Iola Geiger. Um, and Iola was still around when I started working at the library in 1998. So uh, she told me this story <laughs> that she was out there digging a grave, like you do, in the 1950s or 60s. You know, she was the, she was, she and her husband were like the sextons. So they would dig all the graves, they, they kept track of all the records. And she said she was out there, and I'm just picturing like a woman in a 1950s dress, like, I mean, she was probably wearing like overalls or something, but you know, in her dress. Uh, and she saw these people approaching. And so she said she like got up and started like dusting herself off and cleaning herself off to go greet them because that was part of their role. And she, she realized as they got closer that it was three boys, like teenage boys. And they, they were all kind of not paying any attention to her. And they got within probably 25 feet and she realized they were wearing like civil war garb. And then they just walked through the fence, the back fence as if it wasn't there and disappeared out into the mists. Um, you know, so this cemetery was established after the civil war. It was established in 1870. Um, but she always thought that they were kind of Civil War Union kind of young soldiers um, that, that she saw out there. Okay, so I did a bunch of research on this. The rest of this talk I have done many times. This is all brand new for me. So Cheeseman Park, uh, Congress Park in Denver, and the Botanic Gardens. Um, so I don't have as much like narrative about this, but this was the main city cemetery for Denver uh, in the early period. It was called the Pioneer Cemetery. Um, it was also called the Boot Hill Cemetery. It was called the Mount Prospect Cemetery. And so I went through the newspapers that we have online. We have access to the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. And I pulled up articles. And then I had uh, one of my friends works at the Botanic Gardens and she shared this map of, um, 
of who was buried where. <laughs> so this shows the large Cheeseman Park. So this is between 10th and 8th, 6th Avenues? No, 10th and 8th Avenues uh, in Denver and like Humboldt Street over to Clayton. Um, kind of covers the whole area. So it includes the Botanic Gardens, it includes Cheeseman Park, it includes Congress Park, which now has like baseball fields. Now originally Cheeseman Park was the cemetery and it, it was established in 1858. Um, it was then designated as Congress Park, which makes it confusing because there's a Congress Park in the lower left-hand corner, but the main big Cheeseman Park is on the, I, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, Congress Park is on the right. Um, and then the Botanic Gardens was the Catholic Cemetery. Um, and of course, like a lot of pioneer cemeteries, they had it split up. So there was social graves, odd fellows, Masonic, Potter's Field, Chinese area, and the GAR. Uh, and then the Botanic Gardens were the Catholics and the, what is now the parking garage slash children's garden of the Botanic Gardens was the, the Jewish cemetery. So as the city was expanding, they decided that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to this. So as the city was expanding, they decided that this was no longer convenient. Um, real estate speculators were building houses all over the rest of this grid, and they were kind of expensive houses, and so they wanted to build houses here. And um, they decided to uh, contract out to the lowest bidder, um, as early as 1892, they were talking about contracting, moving all the graves and removing the headstones with a single memorial of not more than $1,000, uh, which would be about $30,000 today, um, spec'd out. And then they, they spec'd it out and these prices, when I ran the numbers, I was like, this isn't enough for moving these graves. So it was $5 a grave, which if you translate it now, it was $144 per grave, which if you've ever paid for a funeral, $144 doesn't even begin to cover it. Um, that was just for the ground at, they were gonna relocate everybody to either Fairmont or the Riverside Cemetery. And then it was gonna be $54 modern money uh, for the actual work of moving the, each grave. And within the first month of the project in March of 1893, there were already complaints about open graves and people not being sufficiently careful with the remains. And then by mid-April, like they were being accused of stealing things off of the, the bodies, like rings and stuff. And then by mid-April, the work had stopped completely. So March to April, 1893 is when they, they started doing this. And the newspapers were blaming political factions for declaring the site unsafe or making the site unsafe. And then that the work was not completed. And then there was a lawsuit and uh, you know, all this stuff was happening, and then they finally announced that everybody had 20 days to move any graves they were familiar with at their own expense. So the Jewish folks banded together and moved people. The, the actual first one was the, the GAR. Um, so it was... This big quote at the bottom here. It is a fact conceded by all that the growth of the city will very soon compel the authorities to require the vacation of the old cemetery and the Grand Army have acted wisely in anticipating the fact and secure elsewhere. So the first sign that the cemetery was failing was in 1890. They, they moved all of the Civil War graves to Riverside and they started having Memorial Day um, ceremonies at Riverside instead of in this cemetery, which they'd been doing for years. Um, and then the city started voting on, on, on things, uh, but the, this ruin cartoon, which looks very similar to the actual photo of the, the, the gates, this photo was taken in the 1930s. This was in the newspaper in the 1890, like right in 1890. Um, so they got the, they, they contracted out the, the graves in 1892. And then they had this whole debate about if it's in a park, can you still bury people there? Um, and ultimately they decided that you couldn't 
but they were still burying people there after 1893 because this picture on the lower, these, these two pictures on the lower left-hand corner are the moving of Horace Tabor's grave in the 1930s. Horace Tabor died in 1899. So he died almost 10 years after they supposedly stopped burying people there, but he was buried there. <laughs> so, I, you know, it was a little bit of a free for all. And I tried to find like the definitive, like when did they stop burying people and or when did they dig everybody up and move them? And I sort of came to the conclusion that they never moved everybody. They just moved the headstones. Um, you know, I, I was trying to track it through lawsuits. Um, the lawsuits were 1895, uh, the first day of digging to build the mo memorial that's there was in 1908. Uh, they found three bodies on the first day when they started digging for the memorial. Um, this article about little boys finding, building a fort out of tombstones at the cemetery was from 1927. So there were still, you know, active headstones. Um, and then in 1978, I found that a lady gave a talk very similar to mine about the cemetery and its history in 1978. So it has definitely been a a topic of conversation uh, that whole time. I, I was told by the folks at the Botanic Gardens that they find, um, they still find stuff. Uh, the librarian said one of her early volunteers said that when they were building some of the, like the Oriental garden area, the Asian garden area, they had one bucket for bones and one bucket for weeds. <laughs> um, uh, if you go online and look look for ghost stories of this area, you can find tons. Uh, my favorite is a story of a woman who was walking through the botanic gardens, and she she walked through the the section with the roses, and she found a rose bud laying on the path. So she picked it up. She didn't pick anything, but it was already you know laying there. So she picked it up, and then she was walking by an area where they were building new. Um, a new section of the of the gardens and there was a little tombstone kind of stacked up on the top there and so she put the little rosebud on top of the tombstone and then she said and then I walked around and thought about the fact that this was all a cemetery and I went home and the next morning she got in the shower and when she came out of the shower there was a little rosebud sitting on her bedside table so you know, maybe the little girl came and visited her. Um, there were stories at the time when all of the, in 1893, when all of the active moving of the graves brouhaha was happening, the, the houses nearby started having reports that there were ghosts seen in the mirrors and creepy, and these were all brand new houses at this point. Um, so they were, they were seeing creepy, creepy things. All right, moving on to the mansion, something near and dear to you guys' hearts uh, as, as Highlands Ranch. This photo was taken during the remodeling in 2012. Um, so it, and it's just kind of an overview for people who don't know what the mansion looks like. These are <coughs> uh, two floor plans of the mansion. The upper one is the bottom floor and the lower one is the upper floor. Um, they have since, in the remodeling, they have moved some of the walls around, uh, especially upstairs. They've, they've taken out a couple of these, of these walls to make bigger meeting rooms, but generally this is the layout of the mansion. Now all the red spots on here are places where people have reported paranormal activity, uh, either through uh, formal investigations or through newspaper articles um, and it's been it's been a lot of, of spectral activity and speculations. Um, guesses as to who the ghosts are have ranged from one of Frank Kistler's daughters to various servants to Annie Springer Hughes. Um, strangely no one has accused Lawrence Phipps who is the only person to have known to have died in the mansion. Uh, his bedroom was was right up here in what is now the reception room. He had an apartment there. Uh, toward the end of his life. Um, so I'll just, I'll just hit a couple of highlights here. The, um, 
the big long arrow here, there was a, a group doing an investigation and they saw a light come down the long, the long paneled ballroom that now has like ferns in it. Um, and then on the upstairs, of course, there's, there's the room at the end of the hallway, which used to be called Julia's bedroom, but we've, we think we've pretty much debunked that it was Julia because she like lived to be an old lady. And the stories were of a little girl in that room. Um, but there was a group of nurses who were having a meeting. Now this was all before it was open. And I don't know how many of you guys got to go in there before 2012 when, when organizations could rent it and it was like nobody had been in there. There was still like beer in the in the uh, kitchen from the last parties that they'd had in the '80s, when um, when Shea Holmes had owned it. It was it was very creepy before it got remodeled, and the electricity was always a little a little dodgy. Like it needed a lot of a lot of work, but they would rent it out. Shea Holmes would rent it out in the '70s and '80s, and um, there was this group of nurses that had a, um, they had a table set up for like their buffet. And I believe that was also in this ballroom here. And one of the ladies said she could hear uh, somebody say her name and she, but she was the only one in the room. Um, and then later on they were wandering around upstairs and they interacted with something that was the size of a basketball. Uh, and it was just a dark mass and it responded to yes or no questions by going up and down or side to side. Now this was all in a newspaper article from the late, early 90s, I would say. Um, yeah, so the, then I also have, so there's a group that, that has done paranormal investigations for several years in there. They're kind of their annual Halloween people. And these are some pictures that I snagged off of their website uh, years ago, they're not online anymore. But um, this is an orb by the clock. It used to be the clock was like the only thing that was a landmark because <laughs> there wasn't any furniture or anything. So this is all before the remodel. Um, this is that bedroom upstairs um, that's like the 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 um, the head uh, housekeeper's bedroom, and there's this weird mist going on over here. Remember these pictures were all taken at night. So the fact that there is a window kind of over here shouldn't have been casting this much of a, of a mist. Uh, this one is in the, uh, the long room, another little orb. And then this was from what is now the offices. I, no, this is the hallway looking toward the stairs. And they got this kind of misty, um, stuff going on right outside of the the um the bedroom the big master bedroom that's now the bride's room uh this is my favorite picture that they found um which is in that paneled room and he's holding some sort of misty form that they caught uh in their investigation uh then they caught this this image on the floor. Now this is like massively blown up, but this is in that, um, the steps between the sunken living room and the upper room. They found, they got this face on the floor. And you know, you can speculate, was it Isabel Springer? Two problems, a raging heroin addiction and too many boyfriends. Uh, so, Isabel, it could be Isabel, uh, kind of looks to me like they're wearing a hat and a fur collar kind of thing. Uh, or it could be Annie, John Springer's daughter, Annie, who actually owned the mansion for a little while and killed herself when she was 42 years old because she thought she had cancer. Um, so those are, those are my mansion stories. We can share stories more at the end, but that's, that's the mansion. So the Castle Rock Museum, I did an investigation I'm part of a group called Modern Day Paranormal Investigators, and it came out of doing these ghost talks. And then a guy named Jake Jacobs, who is a, um, who has been doing paranormal investigations for like more than 30 years, came to one of my talks and then sat down with me and, and we talked about it. And I could, 
there weren't any stories about the Castle Rock Museum, but it was a building I could get into because I knew the manager. <laughs> um, so we decided to do an investigation there. Um, now it was the old Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. Uh, when, when Castle Rock was first founded, it was built in 1875. It sat on a different site than it does now. It was behind the fire station in Castle Rock. And they actually, just more pictures of, of the thing. So that's what it looked like after it was abandoned by the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. It, it, um, they jacked it up on a truck and they moved it down Wilcox Street uh, to its present location. Now this is a rhyolite building, you know? <laughs> I mean, they had to get the biggest truck in Colorado to move it. So it is now uh, facing the interstate uh, in downtown Castle Rock. I highly recommend it. It's the Castle Rock Museum. So um, that was all done. The moving was done in 1969. And after much drama of finding a truck big enough, it was moved to the present location on Elbert Street. So this is our little team of paranormal investigators. <laughs> and this is pictures of us. Uh, the lower one is actually at Levere's, but, but the upper one here is, uh, is us setting up the cameras so what we do is we go in and we, um, we're called Modern Day Paranormal Investigators, and we set up um, video cameras, audio recording devices, and some, some paranormal toy kind of things that make noises. Um, and then we lock the building and we leave for an hour. And then we come back and do the, is there anybody here, which is not my favorite part. Um, and we record all of it. Um, just to see if we catch anything. So this is just kind of to give you a kind of an overview of the main display at the museum. Uh, this part right here will show up in a couple minutes. So we set up a camera looking here um, because when we were doing our initial walkthrough, um, some audio popped up that we, that we heard that was a little spooky. Um, and then these are just some other exhibits that were at the museum at the time. Okay, so this is the floor plan of the downstairs. Um, you know, we, we, we noted things like creaky floor. <laughs> um, and then this shows where we set up all of our equipment. We try to mark where we set up the equipment. And then this is the upper level. Um, the offices are upstairs. Uh, so, I am going to pop out for a minute and play some of my audio. And I've turned up my speakers, so hopefully you guys will be able to hear these. We were kind of experimenting with it to begin with. So this one, now you have to listen real closely to this, but this is the sound of one of our, it's called a REM pod, making a beeping noise. Can you hear that? It's a little like, whoop, whoop. it's real quiet. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to hold it right up to my microphone. Let me try it again. It kind of sounds like a smoke detector. But it's a, uh, it's a little device called a REM pod that um, it's like a hockey puck sized thing with, a, with an antenna uh, that just makes a little beeping noise if someone touches it. Um, this one was, you'll hear my voice because um, this was during our initial walkthrough. And then we have enhanced the audio so you can hear it. It's over here. I won't do that. And, yeah. So, so that's, oh, sorry, that is us repeating the audio louder at different, at different settings. But what you can hear really clearly if you are in the room is it saying, kill me? 
And I thought because I was right over a grindstone, like a sharpening tool, I was like, oh my God, kill me. I don't want to sharpen these knives anymore. You know, like some pioneer dude is just sick of like grinding things. Um, <laughs> so that was one. And then here, this was right at the end, another audio recording when we were shutting everything down. And you can hear us shutting everything down. I'm going to turn this off now. So she says, all right, I'm going to, sh I'm going to take this all down. And then you can hear a tiny little okay. I'm going to turn this off now. So I don't know how well any of that is translating over Zoom, but you can hear a little, okay, as soon as we said, we're going to shut down the, shut down the audio. My favorite thing, which is, uh, I call this the, the blockbuster video of, of this um, investigation, is this one. There is audio with this, but if you can't hear it, it's not a big deal. So... Okay, so this is that same corner. There's the grindstone. There's the kill me grindstone, right? And this was in the baggage claim area when it was the uh, when it was the um, railroad depot. And this right here is a little piece of equipment that we set up the camera to point at, hoping that it would catch something if those lights went off. Okay, so we locked the building up and left. And about 20 minutes after we locked the building up, this happened. Um, there, is, there is no one in this building. Why is that camera moving? Um, we tried, it was on a tripod. Uh, we tried jumping up and down. We tried, like, there was a door behind it. It was also locked. You couldn't, there wasn't a breeze. On the actual audio, you can almost hear somebody say, what's that? And then it shuts off. Um, this camera is set to record for 10 seconds. It only recorded four and then shut itself off. Um, so I will play again. And again, it's not like we caught a ghost, but it's the, it's the why is the camera moving um, kind, of, kind of thing. Okay, so then my final story, I'm going to go back to my, my PowerPoint here. Okay, so in March of 1891, this, this story showed up in the newspaper. And over the course of several weeks, the telegraph office in Denver started receiving strange messages. And they were coming collect from an unknown location. Now, you guys are old enough to understand what a telegraph is, but when I have to do this for, like, little kids, I say, it's like a text message, but it's in code. <laughs> and it was, it was over a landline. Um, so these messages start showing up collect, and they come too fast for anybody in the office to translate. When they finally do get somebody to translate, the message doesn't make any sense. This is the message that came up. Um, and you sort of go, okay, that's kind of junk. Um, so they write back and they're like, don't understand and then they get this message that says one three one three one three that comes back and so if you skip every other word it says i was a man who in my time on earth drank considerable and one night was killed on what is known as the continental ridgeway or divide. Until this message is deciphered, I will not rest easy in my grave. And then if you read it backwards, it's the same message. So I was a man. And you can read the whole thing going the other direction. So they write back, ha ha. And then they get, um, they get a message back that's like really fast and the person actually explaining, no, no, I was a person who drank a lot. I died on the, the Connell's divide 
near what is now, and they realized what is now Palmer Lake, like near Palmer Lake Monument, kind of that area. And uh, there <laughs> is a telegraph pole sitting on my chest and I was telegraph operator. So I am sending you a message so somebody knows that I'm here. So the telegraph office sends out a couple of guys they the the ghost even told them like how many poles it was from the the county line or whatever so they they went out to exactly where the where the message had said and they saw a blue light kind of come up the pole tap into the line and then go back down into the ground and when they got back to the office this is the message your two investigators here they have seen me Farewell to Earth. I have been heard and seen. I am satisfied. Goodbye, H. Uh, so that is my ghost talk. Um, so now I think I can open it up to questions. I should have stopped for questions earlier, but I was trying to get through the whole thing because I just have too much to tell everyone. All right. If you have questions for Sean, you can unmute. Uh... Let's see, looking at some of the questions that have come in so far, Sean, we have, uh, one was about your first one, saying that they, uh, Ron says he was a parishioner at St. Francis, uh, mm -hmm. and that the original cornerstone of the old church is now in front of the new church. Oh, yep. Um, I don't know if they did some kind of formal, I'm sure they did some kind of formal decommissioning mm -hmm. ceremony uh, when they moved to the new, the new church in 1966. Yeah. Uh, and let's see, and then uh, Jan is asking, uh, are there really still bodies buried in the Cheeseman Botanic Garden Congress Park area? There are. I was quite surprised because I kept thinking I was going to find an article saying, and then we moved them all and here's how much it cost. Hmm. And I, I, was, I was shocked that I never found that article. Um, and then when they were expanding the parking garage for the Botanic Gardens in 2008, I believe it was, they found two more rows of grapes. Not just two grapes, two rows of grapes <laughs> um, that they had to relocate. Um, uh, I did just talk, they just built a new uh, kind of ground penetrating radar before they did that and um, they didn't find anybody, but that was on the far edge of um, of the of the property there is a new book uh that just came out about ghosts at the botanic gardens i think it might be called what lies beneath um and it's mostly about the house that's at the botanic gardens um and a group that did a paranormal investigation there i wanted it to have way more like history of the house and history of the wearing family but instead it went into the history of the cemetery which was also okay and why the ground around the the house is unstable because they didn't pack everything down um, so anyway, that, yeah, no, there's still people at Cheeseman Park. They don't, they have talked about building a dog park there and they're afraid to build one because it'll get dug up. Um, okay. Uh, then, uh, one more, well, there's more coming in. Uh, one <laughs> from Andrea, uh, asking why are the spirits earthbound? Mm, um, you know, there's several theories as to, why that could be um, sometimes like uh, like maybe some of these ones at the Highlands Ranch Mansion could be a repeating repeating a pattern of some kind like a recording. Uh, they think some of the ones at the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park might be that that it's just like reliving an event over and over again, and those will eventually fade away. Um, but then there there are ones that are like you know, uh, emotional, big emotional moments, which like, I was kind of surprised with the Castle Rock Museum that we were finding anything. The other thing we found with the Castle Rock Museum is there is a seam in I-25 right next to the museum and our audio equipment was so sensitive we could hear every car drive up that scene, seam. So it was like a thump, 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 thump <laughs> through the entire quiet audio recording. Um, so it was, it, it, it's a little tedious to do this kind of investigation because if you set up eight audio uh, recording devices and then you have to listen to an hour on each of those devices to see if you pick anything up. So you're like sitting, you know, with your headphones on just listening really intently. 
um, for eight hours with eight recorders of you're really listening to nothing, trying to like find anything, which, you know, your brain will make sounds. Um, I'm still a little on the skeptical end of some of this um, in that I'm like, eh. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, next one down here. Uh, Dee Dee says the cemetery at Silver Plum is about um, Mike from the train. Is it haunted? I don't know anything about the Silver Plume Cemetery. Um, yeah. I'll have to look it up. The, this, the book that I got a lot of, of these stories out of was called Twilight Dwellers of Colorado. That's where the, um, the, the Fagan's grave story came from. And then there are a couple other stories. There's one near Parker in, the, in this Twilight Dwellers of Colorado book. Um, and she went through and did extensive newspaper research to write that book. So, and it's a, it's an older book, but it's still in print. I'm sure it's at like a Barnes and Noble or an Amazon. Um, you, can, you can find it. Right. I, there's a section on Silver Plume in there. And right. then the, uh, the cemetery in, I want to say it's in La Vida. There's a cemetery that's, that's very uh, supposedly haunted as well. All right. Uh, Kira says, so with the audio recordings in the Highlands Ranch mansion, could there have been the possibility of someone talking during those audio recordings, like another investigator? Uh, yes. So my audio recordings were all from Castle Rock, not from Highlands Ranch. But that group that took the photos that I was showing of Highlands Ranch did catch audio as well. And they probably used the same precautions we do, where we, um, uh, we try to announce that we're making a noise. So like if, if your stomach rumbles when we're doing this, we say, that's Sean's stomach rumbling. Um, we, did, we did another one where there was like, uh, well, actually in Castle Rock, one of my, my co-investigators tripped going up the stairs. And, you know, he said, that's Paul tripping up the stairs. And then right after that, you could hear a little klutz in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually thought that the ghosts at the Castle Rock Museum were a little sarcastic, uh, <laughs> that they were kind of commentating on us looking for them. Um, and Jake, our experienced investigator, said he really speculated that it was, um, and I don't remember the guy's name, I want to say it was Briscoe was his last name. It was the guy who worked there for like 50 years selling tickets. Uh, he was the station agent. Uh, for a long time. And, and like, you know, he would have been there every day, all day by himself as people came and went uh, through the, through the passenger trains, you know, so it would make sense. I'm, I'm going to haunt where I work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, dark corners to hide in those locations. <laughs> yeah, I really want to set up some audio recorders at History Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you can find some definite old uh, things at History Colorado. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, so this comment about the grave diggers getting paid by the box and would shove bones together to get paid more. Yes, that was absolutely true. That was in the newspaper clipping from 1893. They also specked it out at one foot wide by three foot long coffins, which is a child size coffin. So, and they were moving adults. So they would split like one person across three boxes and then try to get paid three times. Um, so yeah, that was part of the scandal that, that caused them to cover it up as it were. Um, yeah. Have I caught any evidence in the cemetery in Spring Valley? No, I have been to the cemetery in Spring Valley quite a bit, um, but I've never taken the audio equipment out there and tried to catch anything, it would be, it would be both a really good location uh, because it's pretty isolated, but it would also be hard because it's outside. So trying to do these audio recordings outside, there's a lot of ambient noise. And we generally try, we have um, extensive release forms that we have the owners of the property sign. Um, We've only done a few sites over the years. Um, we did one where the, in the end, after we did all the collection and all the things, the, the owner of the property would not sign the release. Uh, so we can't talk about that one. But we did a house in Parker uh, last year. And we, we came, uh, so the first, the first time we tried to do this, we set up all the equipment, 
and it was a family house in Parker. And we were just like, this is just like a random house from the nineties. Like what is happening? And um, the couple said, well, they're, they're hearing noises and seeing things. And they had these baby monitors, video baby monitors, and they kept seeing things float through the baby monitors. So we're like, all right, we'll set up all our equipment. And, and uh, they said, well, we can leave the dogs because they won't react at all. Three minutes after we locked everything up and took the family and left the dogs, the dogs started freaking out. And um, so the dog were reacting to something. Um, there were orbs moving around and the dogs were reacting to the orbs. And so then the next time we did it, we took the dogs with us <laughs> and we came back and one of our pieces of equipment was dead because it had run the battery out. Like about 15 minutes after we left that, that thing that's like a hockey puck that makes that little high pitched beeping noise. It, it was like somebody had just grabbed the antenna and held onto it for 30 minutes. And then it, the battery died ultimately. Um, and, and we did catch some other kind of voice kind of things, but it was hard because it's in a residential neighborhood. So it could have been people outside. It could have been, you know, people walking by. I mean, the toilet was flushing when nobody was there. So that was weird. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of, it's, it's a little underwhelming when you actually hear it. Like you're like, really? This is, this is what I'm doing. I'm listening to an empty house for eight hours trying to catch toilet flushing. Okay. Um, so it's really cool. Um, what places would I recommend for a small group? So we're still uh, trying to gather our forces up, but uh, there are some places that will let you come in with the equipment and you really can do this with like iPhone uh, cameras and audio, but we have like motion detector cameras and then we have higher end audio equipment. Um, uh, there are places that you can pay to like stay in a haunted hotel and set up all your equipment. Um, I, you know, a lot of the time it's just a matter of talking to people and then them saying, oh yeah, my house has weird noises. If you want to come over, we can, we can set up the equipment there. And then we explain like, this takes like between five and seven hours. And um, so sometimes people are like, eh, I'm not that into it. Um, we've tried to do public buildings like the Castle Rock Museum and, and um, some other places, but uh, they haven't all worked out. We did one that was a business that uh, the, we set everything up. We did extensive interviews with the staff. And then the owner forgot to tell us that somebody had a key to the building and came in during, like we came back and we were all excited because like our equipment was knocked over and we were like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be amazing. And then it turned out that like her laundry people had come in and knocked over the cameras and we caught them on the camera like coming in and we're like, okay, that's a little disappointing. Cause then that ruins the whole, like we sealed the building thing. So we had to throw it all out. Um, but yeah, uh, just wherever you can get permission is really what I, what I recommend. Um, Jake, uh, our investigator guy, that's kind of our team lead. Um, he's, he's done a lot at the prison museum down in Canyon City. And then he did some stuff at the firefighters museum, but the firefighters museum apparently doesn't let investigators in anymore because too many people. Um, so yeah, there's some, there's some pretty famous Sites. I mean, I think you could wander around at Cheeseman Park. I wouldn't go at night. I would, I would go like sort of on a quiet afternoon, maybe right after it snows. So there's not as many people out. Um, you could do that. <coughs> um, Riverside Cemetery really doesn't have a lot of people wandering around it, uh, especially at this time of year. And it's got a lot of old graves. Um, and I've had some friends that have done investigations there and have caught audio. Um, I, I'm a little suspicious of cemetery ghosts because like, I'm kind of like, why are you haunting the cemetery? Like that seems like a boring place to me to haunt. I would rather do like a house. If I was a ghost, I would do a house or a, another place. Uh, but that's just me. Well, a couple of the ones that were a little bit further up in the uh, chat there is, uh, have you heard of ghost animals and what are some of the most haunted spots in Colorado? Sorry, what was the what was the first one? Uh, ghost animals. Ghost animals. 
I don't know much about ghost animals. Uh, there have been, uh, I, I don't know any stories about that. Um, but the, the thing that I'm always struck by with all of these ghost stories in the newspapers, in books about Colorado, it's almost never native people. And we have to remember that the native people were here for like 10,000 years before all the white people show up. So like, why is it always a lady in a Victorian dress? Like, I, you know, I, I just don't know. And maybe they, you know, maybe that is the kind of like Orby stuff or the, you know, the, the moving of the camera or the whatever. Maybe it's just people that don't speak in languages that we understand. But even on our audio, we're catching like people speaking English. You know, um, Southern Colorado, there would be like no reason to catch people speaking English prior to like 1857. Um, so, you know, I, I'm always, I'm always a little like, why isn't there more diversity in our ghost community? Um, and then famous, famous places in Colorado. Um, my favorite is the Stanley Hotel. Uh, I, I, went there my first weekend that I moved to Colorado. Um, and then uh, there's a really cool story about, I can't remember what it's called. It's near Colorado Springs. And there was a school bus tragedy that happened in a tunnel. And this is not a thing I recommend doing because it's like a one lane tunnel, but people have gone out there at like three o'clock in the morning, parked their car in the tunnel, and then they've had the car shake. They've had handprints show up on the car. It's all been very dramatic. My car is not reliable enough that I would want to drive somewhere at three o'clock in the morning in a one-way tunnel, shut off all the lights, shut off everything, and then be at risk. Because sometimes ghosts will mess with electrical things. So like, I ain't putting myself out there like that. <laughs> um, just saying. Uh, Gold Camp Road, that's what it is. Yes, that's where the tunnels are. Thank you. Oh, can animals see dead people? Yes, we, well, we think with the dogs in that house, we think that the dogs were barking at something, you know, that was happening in that house. Um, and then we, we were like, okay, well, owners of this house, we can tell you one thing, your dogs are not just laying here quietly when you're not here. So maybe you need to put the baby monitors on the dogs <laughs> um, as well. I have not done anything at the Stanley. I really wish I could. Are there sightings like the woman ghost addicted to heroin? Oh, memories or implants. Yeah. Um, Eliza Springer. Uh, Isabel. Sorry, Isabel Springer. Um, yeah, we, we haven't ever had Isabel formally show up. I mean, she died in St. Louis, so it'd be weird for her to like be back at the mansion, but maybe if it was a memory, if it was something, I mean, she had some pretty dramatic moments at the mansion. I mean, there's, there's, there's a door between the bedroom where she and the guy she was cheating on her husband with used to stay so that they didn't have to go out into the hallway where the servants could see them. Just saying, I'm thinking there was some dramatic moments that might've happened in those bedrooms. <laughs> um, yeah. but, and I believe Isabel actually died in uh, New York City. Okay, she, sorry. She was buried in a pop, popper's grave there. But her lover was from uh, St. Louis. St. Louis. <laughs> she was originally from St. Louis. Oh, okay. She knew the guy, um, the, the balloonist. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, you're right, New York. Because Dick Crack, in his book, part of, part of the end of his book is he got a gravestone on her grave. Yep. And Murder at the Brown Palace is the name of that book. Highly recommended. Two new messages. What does it take to become a Stanley Hotel historian or a ghost historian? So, um, uh, I, you know, I'm almost a little bit more like, I didn't know this was a job, but like folklorist is a job where you like collect stories from people. Um, I started collecting these kind of stories. You know, I got into wanting to be a, I started out wanting to do genealogy history because um, my family was always big on telling these kind of ghost stories and the house that my um, my grandparents own in Iowa has a ghost of a World War II sailor who lived in the house before he went off to World War II and then he was killed at Guadalcanal actually and then 
you know, has been hanging out in the house since the 60s, the 1960s. Um, and they've had, you know, various bumps and noises and doors slamming. Um, uh, my grandma claims she's seen him. Um, Mr. Poe, and his dad's name was Homer. So when Home Depot first started showing advertisements for their credit card, it was Homer Depot. And I was like, that's Mr. Poe, he's there. He's, why is he on the Home Depot? Oh, Home Depot, Homer Depot. Okay, I get it. Anyway, Mr. Poe predates Home Depot by, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, but yeah, that was, when I was a kid, I was very into like hearing those stories and then uh, I was the nerdy kid who went to the high school, or I mean, went to the library and decided to read all the books in the Dewey Decimal System in order. And the ghost books show up in the 100s of the Dewey Decimal System, or sorry, 200s. So they're early in the numbering. So I got into the ghost collecting in high school and college. And then, you know, I just kind of stayed on top of wanting to collect ghost stories. And then every time somebody, you would be surprised how many people come to the library with like, I'm, they start out, it's usually a Friday afternoon, and they start out with, I'm researching the history of my house, and then you have to like dig and pull, but eventually you get to, I'm seeing some weird stuff, and I want to know if something happened in my house. Um, so I collected some stories that way. Um, so, you know, I had, I, or if I go to a restaurant or something that's like a historic restaurant, I'll ask the staff. Um, so I just kind of, I'm just noise, nosy and a bit noisy. And then I collect stories from people. Usually as I do these talks, we have time for people to tell their stories. Uh, I don't know that we do this time, but, but normally there's, there's a little, you know, Q&A part where people tell their own stories. So feel free to email me your stories. I'm certainly happy to keep, uh, keep those. Um, and my email is Sean with a U, S-H-A-U-N dot b-o-y-d at gmail.com so just shoot them on over oh yeah we could put it in the chat uh i lived in charles city iowa so northeast northeast iowa so there's my email in the chat uh Salida offers a great ghost tour um yes golden also has a bunch of really good ghost tours that i have been on um so yeah um all right i think you got to the end sean so thank it. you very much for uh your presentation tonight okay and thanks everybody for fun. uh coming and attending uh we did get our cap raised from 100 participants and i did notice that we at one point had 114 different entries and i do know looking at the pictures that a good at least somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of you have more than one person in the household as we've watched in the past but then a lot of times there's two heads that show up on a single login so Excellent. thank you all for attending and uh and we look forward to bringing you more programs and Thanks again to Sean. So next month, uh, we're looking at uh, Louviers. This is going to be our program. If I've been in December, by our annual program. And okay. all right. So thank you all and have a good night. Good night. Thank you.